Hi, you're in a rock floating through space, in a galaxy, in a universe that might be infinite. Wait, how big is infinite? Well, it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and so on. Fun fact, did you know that's equal to negative 1 12th? Stop, what the heck is going on here? The study of everything begins with equations. Every equation has a solution set, the values that make it true. When we solve, we're finding all those values. For example, in 2x plus 1 is equal to 0, the solution is x is equal to negative 1 half. Linear equations have the form ax plus b is equal to 0. If an equation is not in this form, you can manipulate it so that it is. For example, to solve 2x plus 1 is equal to 0, we have to get the x by itself by subtracting 1 from both sides. Then, we divide both sides by 2 to get x is equal to negative 1 half. Sometimes, equations have no solutions or infinitely many solutions. For 0x is equal to 5, there's no solution. For 0x is equal to 0, every value of x works. Sometimes, we have equations with weirder terms. For example, something like this, ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. Big brains call these quadratic equations. Say we wanted to solve this quadratic equation, x squared plus 5x plus 6 is equal to 0. Usually, we try to factor, which for square brains like me, mean breaking into smaller parts, which we can solve separately. When factoring doesn't work, we use the quadratic formula x is equal to negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, which looks complex until you realize it's just mindless plug and chug. When we have equations with square roots, like square root of x plus 2 is equal to x minus 4, we need special care. We square both sides to eliminate the radical, and moving things around gives us x squared minus 9x plus 14 is equal to 0, which factors into x minus 7 times x minus 2. But we must check solutions. x equals 7 works, but x equals 2 doesn't work in the original equation. When we try to solve even more complex equations involving higher powers of x, called polynomials, such as 4x cubed plus 8x squared plus x plus 2 is equal to 0, it begins to get really difficult to solve. Sometimes, though, we can factor them using a couple of techniques and solve the individual parts. Okay, inequalities are the same thing as equalities, but instead of an equal sign, there's a sign showing comparisons between things. For linear inequalities, like 2x minus 3 is greater than 7, we have to isolate x by adding 3 to both sides, giving 2x greater than 10, or x is greater than 5. Then, we have to express this in what the nerds call it, interval notation. In this case, it would be 5 to infinity, because all solutions lie in between 5 and infinity. For polynomial inequalities, like x squared minus 4 is less than 0, First, you have to factor the equation and then find its zeros, or where the left side equals zero. In this case, it's negative two and two. Now, you just have to test points within all the regions defined by the zeros to see if the inequality is true. In this case, the test regions are x is less than negative two, negative two is less than x is less than two, and x is greater than two. Once we do this, we see the only places where the inequality is true is negative 2 is less than x is less than 2. A function is a rule. You give it an input, and it gives you an output. We write functions like f of x is equal to something, although we use f of x and y interchangeably. We could also replace f with another letter, like g, to denote another function. Notice that functions are the same as the equations we looked at before, but with an f of x instead of a 0 on the right-hand side. For example, say that we had f of x is equal to 2x plus 1. If x is 3, then f of 3 is 7. Every function has a domain, which are valid inputs, and a range, which are possible outputs. We usually plot x and f of x on a coordinate grid. So let's look at a couple of functions. If you graph f of x is equal to mx plus b, you get a line, or in more fancy terms, linear functions. Here m is the slope, or how steep the line is, and b is the y-intercept, or where it crosses the y-axis. If you look at these two values, you can pretty much graph any line. Things aren't always straight, though. Quadratic functions, which are written as f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, form parabolas, which are u-shaped. They're basically cooler versions of linear equations since they have that higher power. To plot them, 
you need to find the vertex or the tip of the parabola using this formula and then find the surrounding points by plugging in values into the function. Circles have the form x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is equal to r squared, where the center is at a comma b and the radius is r. Ellipses are stretched circles and they have the form x over a squared plus y over b squared is equal to 1 if they're centered at the origin. A is the length of the ellipse along the x direction and b is the length of the ellipse along the y direction. Hyperbolas look like two mirrored parabolas and have the form x over a squared minus y over b squared is equal to 1. The same thing as ellipses but with a minus sign in between the terms. To graph them, you have to plot the lines f of x is equal to b over a times x and f of x is equal to negative b over a times x and then draw two of those parabola looking curves like this. Quadratics, circles, ellipses, and hyperbolas are collectively called conic sections because they're slices of a cone. There's a lot more special properties to them, so if you're interested, go check out another video. A rational function is the ratio between two polynomials. For example, f of x is equal to 3x squared plus 1 over 2x cubed plus x plus 1 is a rational function. Its graph can include places where the function can shoot off into infinity because the denominator is 0, what we call vertical asymptotes. Horizontal or slant asymptotes may also appear based on the polynomial degrees, which are the highest powers in a polynomial. In general, there's a couple properties about functions. A function might have symmetry about the y-axis and the origin. Symmetry about the y-axis means f of x is equal to f of negative x. For example, this means f of 2 is equal to f of negative 2. Symmetry about the origin means f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. A function that satisfies this property looks something like this. Recognizing symmetry helps us sketch graphs efficiently. All functions can also be transformed. For example, if you replace x with x minus a in a function, the graph shifts to the right by a units. If you replace x with x plus a, it shifts to the left by a units. Adding a constant to the end of a function moves the graph up, while subtracting it moves it down. There's also stretching, compressing, and reflecting. Multiplying the function by a number greater than 1 stretches it vertically, while multiplying by a number between 0 and 1 compresses it vertically. Replacing x with a number times x affects the graph horizontally. If the number is greater than 1, the graph gets narrower. If it's between 0 and 1, then the graph gets wider. Finally, a negative in front of the function reflects it over the x-axis, and a negative inside the function reflects it over the y-axis. We can also add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions. For example, if we wanted to find f plus g of x for f of x is equal to 3x squared and g of x is equal to 5x, we would simply add the functions together. Finally, we can put one function inside another in what we call function compositions. An inverse function undoes what a original function does. If a function takes an input x and gives an output y, the inverse takes that y and brings you back to x. Graphically, the inverse is the reflection across the line y is equal to x. For example, if f of 2 is equal to 5, then f inverse of 5 is equal to 2. As you may recall, a polynomial is a function that can be expressed as a sum of the powers of x. For example, f of x is equal to 5x to the fifth plus 2x squared plus 1 is a polynomial. The degree is the highest power in the function, and the coefficient in front of that term is called the leading coefficient. We're going to learn how to graph polynomials. Polynomials have roots, also called zeros, which are the values of x that make a polynomial equal to zero. To find roots, you set the function equal to zero, and then factor just like we did earlier. Each root has something called a multiplicity, which is how many times that root appears in the factored form of the polynomial. For example, if f of x is equal to x minus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared, the root x equals 2 has a multiplicity of 3, and the root x equals negative 1 has a multiplicity of 2. Multiplicity affects how the graph behaves at that root. If a root has an odd multiplicity, the graph will cross the x-axis at that point. If it has an even multiplicity, the graph will touch the x-axis and turn around without crossing it. Next we need the y-intercept. This is where the function intercepts the y-axis. To find it, simply plug in 0 for x into the function. 
Finally, we need to determine the end behavior, or how the function behaves as x becomes very large or very small. This depends on the degree of the polynomial and the sign of the leading coefficient. By looking at this chart, we can deduce this. Okay, so we have our roots and their multiplicities, our y-intercept, and our end behavior. After that, it's as simple as drawing a smooth curve that connects all these points. If you've been following along, you should be able to graph this function. Anyway, subscribe, or you'll wake up bald.